Welcome back, this is Matt Crump, and we're on Learning Module 5. The topic of this module is behaviorism. It's a school of psychology that emerged and was fairly dominant in America in the 1900s, from the early 1900s to about the 1950s, give or take. So I've titled this a positivist tradition. We're going to learn what that means. Here's a few reminders to get us started. As I mentioned, we're on Learning Module 5. There'll be two mini lectures for this topic. And uh, the first five modules are going to be on our first midterm. So after we're done this one, we're going to do our uh, first midterm in the following week. All right, here's a little roadmap for us. We've got five major topics. We'll cover the first three in this mini lecture. I want to talk about positivism. This is a philosophy, scientific, and a sort of position on science, also a kind of social movement. And then we'll, we will talk about behaviorism from the lens of four different people and their versions of behaviorism. All right, before we jump right in, I want to return to some th general themes in the course that I'm hoping to develop. And one of the themes is explanation. So a big goal is to examine explanations of cognitive processes as we learn about different processes over this course. The era of behaviorism developed what I'm going to call functional explanations in the tradition of positivism. So uh, one goal for this lecture and for your reading of the textbook is to have some sense of what that means. Also, I think if we look across the writings of different behaviorists, we'll see that a major goal of behaviorism was to predict and control behavior. So, uh, in many ways, they weren't particularly interested in mechanistic explanations and knowing why or how something makes something else happen in cognition or behavior. But they were very interested in coming up with ways to formally measure behavior and be able to um, predict the measurements. And if you were able to predict people's and animals behavior, which can get pretty complicated, you might be able to also control their behavior. And this could enable uh, things like social engineering. So many of the behaviorists uh, were thinking the tools they were developing could be applied in society in lots of different ways. Before we go into behaviorism proper, which was, you know, mainly 1910, 1920, 1930, I want to bring up a modern example. This is uh, the title here is The Rabbit Hole. This is a modern example of using what we call big data for prediction and control over human behavior. So if you thought the idea of behaviorism or the goals of behaviorism were outdated because they're 100 years old, they're not very outdated. And various uh, I guess groups, people, companies are enacting some of these ideas uh, in our modern world. So, for example, The Rabbit Hole is a podcast. It's by The New York Times. It's very interesting. It describes uh, what happens to one person when they watch YouTube over and over and over and over. So they watch lots of YouTube videos. And the thing that's going on here is, you know, YouTube provides many videos, billions of hours are watched all the time. They've got this huge database of what the videos are and who watches what. And they are developing algorithms to predict and control your behavior when you watch YouTube. So for example, one of the goals of the algorithm was to suggest new YouTube videos to you in a way that would cause you to watch YouTube longer. This was, uh, whoops, 
Okay, so it turns out that YouTube was fairly successful at doing this, and their algorithm is capable of suggesting videos to people that will make them watch YouTube longer than they otherwise would. I don't think that YouTube has an explanation in the sense of a totally mechanistic account of why this is happening, but they have a functional model that does the job quite well. Uh, this can have some interesting implications for individual people, and you can learn about that in, in this podcast, where one of the YouTube users watches so many YouTube videos, uh, the algorithm seems to suggest videos across a spectrum of political ideology, and the main character uh, seems to uh, basically have his own beliefs being shaped by the ideologies being presented across different YouTube videos. And as the algorithm slowly suggests new kinds of videos that will cause him to watch YouTube longer, they also start suggesting uh, videos that kind of change their ideological viewpoint. And uh, this YouTube viewer also seems to go on a journey of uh, different viewpoints based on the YouTube videos they were watching. So I thought it was an interesting example that relates to some of the themes we'll talk about in this lecture. So I encourage you to go check out that podcast. And if you want to get some course credit for listening to the first episode, there's a writing assignment about that. And you can feel free to check that out. So let's rewind. We're going to go back to the 1910s and the 1940s, roughly, when the School of Behaviorism was a dominant perspective in American psychology. And the first place we're going to go is actually before that. We're going to look at August Comte. He's the father of sociology. He's an early philosopher of science. You could see uh, he was born in 1798, died in 1857. And August argued that society and science develops through three stages. He calls them the theological, metaphysical, and the positive stage. The ideas that he kind of put out there, uh, I'm going to talk about them because uh, many behaviorists seem to latch onto his way of thinking. And the goals of behaviorism m often map on to themes described by Comte. Um, let me give an example of what he meant by his stages of explanation. And, you know, he's thinking about how do we organize things like the knowledge that people have about the world, uh, how do we organize in, in universities the different disciplines and different departments? How should we think about those things? Uh, should there be some natural order to different science departments and maybe like, you know, I don't know, physics, chemistry, biology? He's, he's thinking about these kinds of issues. So in his theological phase, he suggests that society explains phenomena of interest in terms of supernatural powers. So for example, if you're trying to explain how your mind works, you might attribute that to a soul or to spiritual forces. Next, Comte suggests that uh, there is a metaphysical stage of explanation. And, when society reaches this uh, stage, it replaces the supernatural forces with abstractions. Here, uh, for example, the mind may be its uh, psychic forces that we don't totally understand. In Comte's last stage, he calls it the positive stage. And what is achieved here for Comte it, and for him, it's the goal of science. It's to achieve a description system 
that can mathematically describe, predict, and control a process of interest. It's an interesting bar for science. For example, if you were thinking about, well, how do I explain, how would anyone explain why some people watch some YouTube videos longer than other YouTube videos? You could imagine, well, you'd have to explain how cognition works and how preferences work and how the brain works and how eyeballs look at things and how light enters the retina. So there's physics and chemistry and biology and physiology and all these things, how they all work together. Um, you'd need to know all of those things in order to fully explain it. On the other hand, in terms of positivism, if you could just come up with some mathematical way to describe, predict, and control the process of interest, you might not have to do all of those things. For example, YouTube figured out uh, an advanced uh, learning algorithm that was totally capable of describing, predicting, and controlling the process of interest for them, which was to uh, figure out how to suggest people videos that they would watch a little bit longer than normal. All right, Compt wasn't only thinking about different st stages of um, that society moves through in terms of science and its goals for explanation. He was interested in uh, taking these concepts into uh, a social movement. So I've got a slide here called Scientific Utopianism. And Comte thought that his ideas about positivism could be used to improve society. Here's the motto of positivism, love as principle and order as the basis, progress as the goal. So in addition to proposing about, uh, well, <laughs> so Comte also proposed uh, a humanistic religion based on positivism to replace the Catholic Church. And it took off in a few different places there. I think there was a Church of Positivism in New York City. And here's a picture of one, uh, a temple that was built in Brazil around here. Oh, sorry, in, in Brazil. And the reason I'm bringing up positivism is because, as I mentioned previously, behaviorism was a science in this tradition. And we will see Lots of the themes we just talked about as we discuss behaviorism uh, by looking at these four individual behaviorists in the following lecture. I also want to point out at this point before we jump into Watson's behaviorism that behavior, behaviorism was not a monolithic entity. All of these four people, for example, didn't have all the same views. There was many more people who had different views on what behaviorism was. And some of the goals were fairly uh, buttoned down in a sense. They were about figuring out functional relationships and uh, finding ways to mathematically describe and predict aspects of behavior. And so that's certainly one way in which behaviorism was a science in the tradition of positivism. But also uh, some of the broader goals of positivism to do things like create a religion and have major influences on society as a social movement. Uh, lots of the behaviorists in psychology were thinking about doing this too. And they, um, well, we'll see some nice examples of uh, that side of things also as we head through these four people. So let's get started. We're going to talk about Watson's behaviorism and then Tolman's behaviorism, and then we'll wrap up this first part and head into part two in another video. Here we go. Here is J.B. Watson. He was an early proponent of behaviorism. You may have heard of this uh, psychologist. He's famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it. He was an APA president in 1915. Uh, just to connect to some of the themes we were talking about in our eugenics module, Watson was also listed as a researcher in the eugenical news. And he was fired in 1920 due to a divorce scandal. He left psychology 
And actually, after he left psychology, he continued to push his ideas about behaviorism, and much of his uh, uh, influence, uh, so his influence in pushing behaviorism ideas uh, definitely increased after he was fired. Here's one example of his research that he conducted. Uh, you might be familiar with the L Little Albert study. So Watson was attempting to generalize Pavlovian conditioning to humans, and he trained an infant to show fear responses to many kinds of stimuli. For example, little Albert was exposed to objects like a white rat, masks, burning newspapers, and then uh, very loud sounds like the banging of a hammer that would cause traumatic reactions in the infant. And so here's a picture from the research where Watson is sort of declaring that, you know, after he's got this infant to be able to fear almost anything, he, the infant uh, will even fear Santa Claus. Apparently, Watson attempted to desensitize the infant, but uh, the infant was removed before the experiment was finished. We will see, uh, we're going to move on to Watson's contribution as a behaviorist. At the same time, uh, he is a uh, notorious or highly controversial figure for many reasons. And I have a chapter that I found that does a very good job of explaining some of these aspects of Watson. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about him, then do the writing assignment uh, associated with Watson posted for this learning module. Okay, so this is a little picture without a border. This is the front cover of Watson's book called Behaviorism. And you could read it if you want. Here's the link. Go to the Internet Archive and you could go and read what he was saying right here. So what was Watson saying about behaviorism? If we look at uh, how he builds his argument at the beginning of the book, what we see is that he follows Comte's positivism ideas to criticize psychology and replace it with behaviorism. Here's a reminder, here's Comte's stages of explanation, and uh, you could think about these as stages of explanation if you want to, but you could also think about it as a structured format for criticizing something for not being very scientific. So you could say, oh, theology is not very scientific. Metaphysical abstractions are not very scientific. But positivism is scientific, and it's the one true way to do things. And so what Watson was doing was kind of taking that narrative and using the, the, these three points to try to replace psychology with his version of behaviorism. So first of all, in the book he argues that introspective psychology, which we've talked about in this course, has a strong religious background. So he's sort of giving allusions to Comte's theological stage. He's, uh, so he suggests that introspectionists invoke God concepts to explain the mind. He also accuses the introspectionists of referring to abstract entities like consciousness, which are unscientific. And this is uh, Comte's metaphysical stage. So after he uses Comte's stages to criticize people doing introspective psychology, he says we need to stop all of that and uh, it attempts to advance behaviorism as the proper scientific discipline to study people and animals. So this would be the positive stage. Here's Watson's idea. It's pretty simple. He had um, an SR system approach. 
He wanted to identify terms like stimuli and response, and then make very grand claims about possible functional relationships between them. One thing that he did, well, let, let's uh, take a look. So here we have a little picture from his book where he tries to say that, you know, basically all, all of these things right here are what we need to do for a science of behaviorism. He suggests that um, stimuli lead to responses in organisms. So if you know what a stimulus is, what you need to figure out is what the response will be that is caused by that stimulus. That's one, one kind of algebraic equation you might be trying to figure out. On the other hand, if you have seen a response has been given, you could try to figure out, well, what was the stimulus that caused that response? Watson suggests that the only two things you should ever care about are what is the stimulus, and you need to determine what that is, and then what is the response that was caused by the stimulus. And as soon as you've determined what both these things are, you're done. You, you, you basically figured out what stimulus causes what response. If we could just make some kind of huge phone book of all the stimuli and all the responses that the stimuli cause, we could predict everything. We could just predict what responses would happen given a stimulus or given a response happened, what the stimulus was. Uh, and I guess we could give this huge book of stimuli response mappings to engineers and they'd be able to, well, let's, let's take a look what, uh, what Watson is thinking here. He's thinking that, um, if we could figure out stimulus response relationships, uh, the science of behaviorism would enable social engineering at a broad scale. So for example, this is from his book also. Here's some different stimuli. Um, and he's, you know, thinking about, well, if you knew what these stimuli were, what would the responses be in society? So one stimulus could be the overthrow of monarchy. The formation of a Soviet government could lead to question mark. What would that lead to? Or uh, war or easy divorce or substitution of physiological ethics for religion. Uh, these are some questions he had. Similarly, he was thinking about, okay, he, here's some, for him, desired social responses he would like to see in society. For example, he would like um, there to be people joining the church, or he would like people to be more truthful, or he would like people to acquire skills more quickly. Those could be desirable social responses for him. And the question in Watson's mind was, well, what's, we just need to figure out what stimuli we need to do on society, for example, that more people will do these things. I'm just going to back up a slide and mention this last point here. So Watson was convinced that all we really needed to do was figure out what stimuli were connected to what responses, but he didn't do anything as detailed as supplying uh, mathematical formulas for describing different stimuli or different responses or functional relationships between those two things. He was a, I would call him more of a salesman or even a snake oil salesman, making very broad claims about how behaviorism was going to uh, take over psychology, take over the world. I mean, he even, had uh, proposed concepts of utopia in this book, which is another aspect in which what Watson is doing is in the tradition of positivism. So he was thinking that behaviorism would become a whole new way of life to improve society. And let's take a look at this here. Uh, he wants to contrast things that have been dominated by the metaphysical concept of consciousness up till now and how they'll be replaced with better new things from Watson. So for example, introspective and functional psychology, they'll be replaced by behaviorism. Philosophy, that will gradually disappear and become the history of science. Ethics, 
Well, experimental ethics based entirely upon behavioristic methods will replace that. Social psychology. This is rapidly becoming a behavioristic study of how groups, family, village, national, church, and the like build up habits in the formative period and thus maintain control of things throughout life. He goes into religion will be replaced among the educated by experimental ethics. Psychoanalysis will be replaced by behavioristic studies on the human child. So Watson is thinking big. All right, I got a few more things I want to say about Watson. I was going to go into Tolman for this part. I think I'll stop here and then we'll do Tolman, Hull, and Skinner in part two. Okay. Um, yeah, a final couple thoughts about Watson here. One is that just in terms of the timeline, he, uh, he yeah, he, he got, there was a divorce scandal for Watson. I believe he was uh, having a relationship with one of his graduate students and he was also, I think, married to the daughter of uh, something like the president of the university. I'm probably getting some of those details wrong. If you want to know more about those details, do go read the chapter on Watson by Oksana Yakushko in poly uh, Scientific Pollyannaism. That's in the uh, writing assignment for this learning module. But I'll also say, you know, he he was kicked out of his position at John Hopkins as a professor due to this divorce scandal. At the time, he was a member of eugenics societies, and he got kicked out of those societies too during this divorce scandal. You know, eugenics had a bunch of, um, let's call it, si similar goals to positivism. It saw the movement as a progressive social movement that would create a kind of scientific utopia. And I think Watson might have been a little bit um, irritated by being kicked out of that group. And so perhaps his formation of the book Behaviorism uh, was a little bit in response and saying, okay, well, I'll create my own version of scientific utopia based on principles of behaviorism. So he's kind of putting it out there as an alternative to what would have been a dominant viewpoint uh, of the day in terms of eugenics. So that's a final summary here. We will go into part two in the next mini lecture. See you soon.